Welcome everyone to the World Affairs Council Upstate and our Beyond the Headlines speaker series focused today on rising discontent in Russia. Is Vladimir Putin's regime vulnerable? Today's speakers are going to talk to you a little bit about how over the last 20 years, uh, Putin has been able to consolidate power. What are the tools that have enabled him to do this? How has he stayed in, in power so long? How has he managed to escape repercussions from um, the, the rest of the world? What is it about America that thinks differently towards um, Russia's political system and how this regime has stayed in power? Questions arise right now about his opposition, Nalvaini, um, waiting in prison and the new charges that have come up against him possibly. So before we go into this talk, I do want to let you know that your questions are welcome. However, I ask that you type them into the chat room. Our moderator will go through those questions and give them to the speaker so that they can be given in an organized manner and so that we can keep the flow um, going. Today at the end, we will have a Q&A session as well. Um, so please go ahead, jot down your questions and take note. The World Affairs Council Upstate is holding these speaker events each month throughout the month of May, and I offer you the opportunity to join us. We hope to be back in person possibly next month. If you're interested in the World Affairs Council Upstate and you're not a member, we welcome you to check us out. You can email me at tracy at upstateinternational.org, or you can check out our website. Just Google World Affairs Council Upstate and it'll pop right up. The next person um, who's going to take over today is Mr. Rob Rowan. He is the chairman of our World Affairs Council Upstate Steering Group, and Rob's going to introduce our speaker and moderator. So, Rob, I'm going to hand it off to you. Okay. I want to ask uh, everybody to, uh, if you are not one of our speakers, please shut off your camera uh, so we don't have this distraction of having you there. So, welcome to this timely program. I am Rob Rowan, the chair of World Affairs Council Upstate and I get to introduce our speakers, which is always such a great honor. Uh, we plan our next Beyond the Headline series to, li to be live at the Kroc Center, which I am excited about. And I ask you to consider thinking about supporting our programming. Perhaps your company would like to be seen before our learned group of attendees, or maybe it's just something you have enjoyed and realized that you can be part of making this happen, making these amazing lunches and lunch and learn experiences happen. So I ask you, if you can, and, and, and this would work for you, contact us at Upstate International, and we'll see how we can make it so. And now for our guests, Matthew Plasek is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of South Carolina Upstate. He holds a BA from the University of South Alabama and a PhD in Political Science from the University of Mississippi. His research focuses on the influence of social media and the internet on political attitudes in new democracies and non-democratic regimes, which fits. Specifically, he's interested in how social media use correlates with legitimacy and perceptions of democracy. His work has been published in Democrat, Demo, Democratization, excuse me, that's a hard one, East European Politics, the International Journal of Communication, and the Washington Post Monkey Cage blog. Now that I would love to see. I would have to look that one up. Um, as you know, what makes our conversation so dynamic is having a great moderator. Today's is Dr. Trevor Rubenza, who is the Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Department of History, Political Science, Philosophy, and American Studies at USC Upstate, and also will be talking next month on Africa and China, so uh, hopefully you'll come for that one too. His research specializations include U.S. foreign policy and Africa defense policy. So at this point, I want to say, Matt, the floor is yours. I look forward to hearing you, and let's go. All right, Rob, thank you for that introduction. I'm going to uh, set up to share my screen here um, and start. We're going to have a, a little PowerPoint slide here since we're not in person. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, thank you to the World Affairs Council, um, Tracy, Rob, and everybody for inviting me to uh, do this. Um, we're going to start, and we're going to talk about rising discontent in Russia. Um, we're going to talk about Vladimir Putin's regime. We're going to talk about the dynamics of, of uh, legitimacy in autocratic regimes. 
<clears throat> and so um, we're going to get some background information first, uh, a little political science overview, uh, and then we'll dive into talking about Russia specifically. Uh, and as you see here, we have the picture of uh, Vladimir Putin with uh, two dogs on the um, his yearly calendar coming up for 2022 um, of Vladimir Putin um, with animals. Um, and one of the things and the reason I show you this, you know, it's, it's kind of different. You know, you're used to seeing um, kind of these pictures of Vladimir Putin with uh, riding a horse shirtless or out fishing shirtless. And uh, this plays into the same role, though. Um, the idea behind this is sort of like we would see in representative democracy today. You know, historically with uh, autocratic regimes, uh, specifically ones that are totalitarian, they use a lot of hardline propaganda, a lot of indoctrination from an early age. Um, whereas today, uh, at a certain level, the idea is try to make yourself seem almost like a man of the people, almost like our own representatives would. So if you think of the presidential race in the United States, um, the first state, of course, in the primaries is the Iowa caucus. And so with that, you often see candidates going to the Iowa State Fair and, you know, maybe wearing 10-gallon hats, maybe um, trying all kinds of different fried foods to make themselves seem like common um, American people. And, and this is sort of the same thing, only in an autocratic um, way. And that's kind of leans into why Vladimir Putin has been so successful. There, there are many reasons, but one of them is trying to connect with common um, Russians with this idea of, you know, how to stabilize, create order, and, and, um, and, and create a, a working state after the fall of communism, and after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So, um, so there's something here to this, not just, you know, a nice fun picture with Vladimir Putin with, with a couple dogs wrestling in the snow. So uh, moving on, though, a, a quick background. How do autocrats retain power? Um, there are four main ways. I'm going to go through three of these kind of quickly, and I'm, I'm happy to ask, answer questions on these. Um, but these won't be the these first three won't be the main um, kind of focus of this uh, lecture and this discussion. Um, coercion and surveillance, so public co cooperation ensured through violence and surveillance. Obviously, we know this is part of of the regime in Russia. Um, we can see you know recent reports of of uh, you know, poisoning of Navani, um, extrajudicial killings of uh, opposition members, um, mysterious deaths of of people who are whistleblowers um, and that sort of thing, also marking them as extremist groups. And, and this has its uh, its origins in early in the early years of Vladimir Putin's uh, regime, the idea of trying to, first of all, he, he did want to ostracize this extremism um, in the early years of his power. And so um, after doing that, and we're going to talk about the origin stories of that, the, the um, the idea is to marginalize your opposition and list them as extremists. And so expanding that umbrella of what is defined as extremism within the Russian state. And so co coercion and surveillance obviously has its, um, has its place within Vladimir Putin's rule in that. Um, personality cults, public is encouraged to obey um, based on extraordinary qualities and ideas. I don't see this with people like Lenin, Stalin, uh, the Ayatollah, uh, as well as Hugo Chavez, uh, to Vladimir Putin to a lesser extent. Like I said, it, it, his is more akin, it's less heavy handed, like you would see with Lenin, Stalin, the Ayatollah, um, more akin to almost symbolic representation as we would see within the United States. But there is um, some revolution around a cult of personality. Um, on his birthday, um, the Russian um, uh, Twitter, uh, the account wished him a happy birthday and there was him walking in a field with a giant brown bear um note it was actually stolen from uh, the picture was stolen from i believe the new york um uh museum of uh history or museum of art and it, it was a alaskan brown bear but so so to speak but um anyway it was uh, a picture of him walking in a field with a bear again there's still some cult of personality um emphasis there as well Co-optation, you bring members into a, uh, of society into a beneficial relationship with the state. Um, you have corporatism, where you sanction limited numbers of groups for the members of the public to join. Um, generally, this takes place around business um, and labor groups, but also political parties can be sanctioned as outlets for um, basically giving people a, an idea that their voice is being heard. Um, and, and there can be other events as well. 
Um, Vladimir Putin's event, the main line or the direct line is uh, basically um, he sits and takes pre-screened um, phone calls from members of the Russian public where they talk about um, issues in society and this sort of thing. And it's widely viewed. There are more viewers in Russia um, for this event than there are viewers of the Super Bowl in the United States. And so basically what he does in, in it is he takes calls. People generally ask about very small problems, such as housing something, and he says, I will look into this, I will look into this. And he gives people kind of this um, idea that they're being listened to. And so corporatism can be more formalized generally is what we talk about, but in the Russian sense, um, in some cases, it can be a little more um, uh, diffused. Um, clientelism uh, is where states provide benefits directly to members of the public for their support. Um, within the Russian regime, obviously some of this, a lot of that goes to um, kind of your main, your main oligarchs, uh, people who uh, are CEOs or owners of the oil companies, CEOs or owners of major corporations. Um, and they're kind of this outside influence network within Russian politics um, that's outside of the administrative state itself, but also has direct ties to Vladimir Putin um, and the United Russia Party within that. And so um, not the main focus here with these three, but uh, still important when it, we talk about how autocrats remain retain power, because it takes different pillars and different strategies um, to essentially retain rule when you're limiting people's freedoms. And so um, the final one is legitimation. And we can go all the way back to the Weberian, um, Max Weber's definition, the basis of every system of authority and correspondingly, every kind of willingness to obey um, is a belief, a belief of virtue um, by which people exercising authority are lent prestige. Um, in non-academic terms, it's why we follow the rules we follow, right? Um, so why do people follow the rules at, of a system? And generally it's why, um, it, it's because that it's seen as, leg, as legitimate. And so in the U.S., for example, we see our laws as um, generally rational and, you know, and, le and um, so we have rational le legal legitimacy where we see our laws as rational and neutral, right? Um, trying to focus on um, equality of, um, opportunity to participate uh, politically, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so legitimation is going to be the um, key point of this lecture also because, well, this is what I study. I study public opinion, legitimacy, um, why people trust their regimes, why people tend to support their regimes. And so that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, and we're going to craft, you know, uh, kind of look at how autocrats craft legitimacy more broadly, but also how Vladimir Putin has done that. And so why focus on legitimacy? Well, generally, it's more stable than other forms of control. Um, it provides st stability in the face of um, other legitimate regime options um, in the point in uh, times of crisis um, by providing long term um, support for government from the populace. And, and people tend to, um, you know, even if they tend to trust, distrust, and we'll get into a little bit of the mechanics of this later, um, they can also. Um, find some stability in their attitudes um, in the face of legitimate other legitimate regime options, such as democracy, such as um, other leaders within a, a, a political system, um, but also at times of crisis, right? That this idea that we've seen crisis points before, but we trust that this regime is kind of the path forward. Um, also, it's can be more stable than other forms of control, repression, surveillance, and violence can lead to backlash and up uprisings, protests. Um, and sometimes there are only so far you can go with repression before um, it leads to a, a large-scale protest, large-scale demonstrations, and large-scale, you know, um, pushback on your regime. Um, uh, although he's stabilized it somewhat now due to help with um, Russia and Iran, uh, Assad uh, is an example of this, right? Um, protests during the Arab Spring, um, Arab uprisings started out mostly peacefully. They wanted, you know, retribution for, um, for you know, the killings and jailings of a couple of young boys. Quickly turned into wanting, you know, more bread, gas and oil. Assad chose repression and it uh, basically um, exploded into the Syrian civil war. So repression can be um, a useful tool for autocrats, but can also um, have a, a uh, uh, backlash to that. Co-optation can be expensive. Um, if you're looking to pay off members of the public, 
um, for your support. How many members of the public do you have to pay off? How far down the ladder do you have to go um, to get people to support you? Uh, usually the regimes that are most effective at this are your oil wealthy countries. Um, Russia is one of these, um, but Russia is also much bigger than a lot of the other oil, oil rich countries we talk about, like Qatar, um, UAE, uh, Kuwait, et cetera, that can um, essentially funnel a lot of that money down to um, the mass public. So um, as we get into that, let's talk about how autocracies legitimize themselves. Um, historically indoctrination, I alluded to this earlier, it's less prominent um, than has been done historically under totalitarianism. As I talked about, um, under communist rule, under uh, fascist rule, but especially communism, as that was a much longer period of time um, than fascist rule, you saw, you know, stark indoctrination, starting with, you know, um, the education system, uh, you know, repatriate, repatriating um, people into this ideology of, you know, communism, the ideas behind it, um, why we follow communism, you know, it's socialized into people from um, day one. Uh, and it goes through school, it goes through everyday life, as we talked about with the, uh, you know, personality cults, and even to the news um, that the states would present on traditional mediums under communism. Um, you never heard the bad news, right? It was always, if that was ever, you know, if the bad news ever got out, it was very well managed by um, the elites in society, by the media itself, um, to make the regime itself not look bad. And so um, there is obviously propaganda today that takes a much different form. Um, you know, if you look at old videos or old um, news programs from the Soviet days versus perhaps today's RT.com, um, previous generations, it was, you know, what we will tell you in the news. And, and um, as some would put it, um, how the regime created the truth, right? Um, whereas today's autocracies, there is propaganda, but the propaganda mostly involves framing, um, which is the way in which you tell a story. It doesn't me mean to completely bend reality into the idea that, um, that, you know, our regime never does anything wrong, there's never any mistakes, but that, you know, these other regimes make mistakes, and so it shouldn't be a legitimate um, sort of option for democracy because yeah it's messy and chaotic and we're going to get to that later on with um, Vladimir Putin and, and kind of this rule um, through propaganda and media as well. Passivity, this is where autocratic rulers they're not necessarily interested in mobilizing the population. Um, in democracies we see um, democratic rulers are interested in mobilizing especially segments of the population that they can that they think can help them win elections right democracy is supposed to be participatory that's kind of the base um you know underlying you know one of the base underlying themes of, of democracy and especially liberal democracy is that every citizen should have the ability to participate equally with other citizens that's not the base assumption under authoritarianism um you don't want to necessarily mobilize the population. What you want to do is, yeah, you might want to mobilize supporters, um, but you tend to want to foster a sense of resignation to the regime's rule. Uh, and Vladimir Putin has done this masterfully. Um, we can see that for anything from, you know, like we talked about the extrajudicial jailings, killings of opposition members, um, even to, you know, the, the sense of resignation. Um, there, there's some nice stories about elections um, and how they actually, you know, focus and, and force this sense of resignation that, yeah, they would win anyway, they would win anyway. And um, this is something that's difficult for us to measure and difficult for us to talk about in political science because it's a negative effect, right? Um, how do you know when people have dropped out of the political system um, and, and that sort of thing? And so that, that can become a little um, bit hairier to kind of talk about. Um, and, and also, this would tended to be used a little more heavy-handedly under a... a uh, totalitarianism, also under other forms of, uh, of autocracy, such as in um, the monarchy in Saudi Arabia, really doesn't seek participation from outside units. So the more oligarchical kind of your leadership is, the more cut off from the mass public your leadership is, the more you're going to see um, them try to induce this idea of passivity on the, regime, on the uh, mass public. Finally, we have performance and democratic procedures, and I'm really going to lean heavily into these two talking about how Putin has crafted uh, these two performance. Um, as long as the regime is able to deliver on its promises, 
less freedom than democracy, right? All of this is comparative. There, there's, um, we talk about democracy and autocracy. We're not talking about necessarily ones and zeros. We're talking about moving kind of continuums here um, of, of, you know, stations um, uh, within autocracy, how much freedom within autocracy, um, as well as within democracies. So as long as regimes are able to deliver, um, a lot of times publics will accept less freedom um, in it, and they sacrifice that in, uh, for the sake of order, for the sake of stability and economic growth. Um, and we see this heavily with Russia. Also, you can probably think of another one that comes to mind right away, um, China, uh, perhaps even Singapore to a certain extent. Um, so we see, you can see as long as economic growth, political order and stability are ensured, um, some people will accept less freedom for that. Um, and then finally, democratic procedures. This is uh, a way that autocracies legitimize themselves that's really new. Um, it really started after the third wave of democratization. So third wave democracies generally in Latin America, generally in Eastern Europe, um, Southeast Asia, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, starting in you know the late 1980s, or the early 1980s, excuse me, with the fall of military dictatorships in Latin America, spreading to Eastern Europe with the fall of communism, um, Southeast Asia in some cases as well in there, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa, some countries there, um, democratizing in the late 80s, early 90s as well, um, and, and all the way to the early 2000s. So democratic procedural, one, this is a way for autocrats to you know, hold semi-competitive multi-party elections or really uncompetitive multi-party elections, depending on the regime you're in, and you instrumentalize these to demonstrate to domestic and international audiences that the regime follows the will of the people. So in a way, it's an attempt to hoodwink kind of the mass populace, both domestically and abroad, and it works. And I'm going to tell you a fun story with this uh, in just a second. Um, but you, you try to demonstrate that the regime follows the will of the people. And even for those that, that you know, know, hey, that this is false, this is, some of them are regime supporters to begin with. Um, so, you know, you have that. And secondly, this comes about because of the way democracy dies today. Um, and we're going to see that story kind of here with Russia, um, that doc democracy doesn't necessarily die like it did in the, you know, 30s and 40s or the 60s and 70s, where you had coups and overthrows of, of democratically elected governments. No, today it happens by the slow whittling away of civil liberties, civil rights, um, competition and rule of law to the point where there is no coherent opposition that can um, effectively challenge the, the party and government. And so that's what we're always concerned about with democratic backsliding today. Countries like Hungary, countries like Poland, even to, the, to an extent the United States, um, we can talk about that as well. But in Russia, we're going to see this story play out in, in its you know, full act um, from democratization early on to um, authoritarian consolidation under Vladimir Putin. And the latter two, like I said, those two have grown in prominence. And for those, you know, there's a lot of people who say, well, can you really trick these domestic and international audiences that these democratic procedures aren't just uh, for show, right? Um, and I'll tell you a story real quick. In 2016, uh, I was in uh, Costco here in Spartanburg, um, and I was uh, over by the, the uh, cafeteria area, and uh, I overheard a conversation um, as I was trying using the you know uh, coffee grinder machine over there, and, and uh, um, overheard a conversation of. of a couple of uh, women eating, having lunch, and I overheard one woman say, okay, uh, I don't understand, you know, people are, are uh, bashing Trump for saying Vladimir Putin is a good leader for Russia. Uh, and so obviously with my background of study, Eastern Europe, you know, Russia, post-Soviet states, um, my, my ears perk up, so I'm listening, because if you argue under this, you know, idea of order, stability, and growth, there would be a decent amount of Russians who might agree with you. Um, and, uh, and so my ears perk up. She said, you know, I don't understand why they're bashing Trump for saying Putin is a good leader. Um, I think there's proof that he is. And so my ears perk up. And she says, um, within her next breath, I mean, look how many times he's been elected. Um, and, and so if you don't think that these elections and this democratic procedures can actually hoodwink people or, or trick people into this idea that, um, that the regime follows the will of the people, it, you know, it can trick people even outside the regime, maybe not the most poor people outside of the regime, but it can trick them into this idea that 
hey, they're following the will of the people. And so we'll talk more about that as that has become a big part of democratic, of uh, autocratic legitimation. So there's the background stuff. There's your political science lesson for the day. Um, we'll uh, kind of move in now to a little bit more discussion of how has Putin done this? And so the big two things I want to talk about are obviously the two things we noted with the autocratic legitimation um, that have become more important, performance and democratic procedures. So let's talk about a little bit of history of Russia, because this really creates the situation for how you could see a Vladimir Putin rise to power, um, create a stronghold on power, and then consolidate that autocratic regime. And then finally, what that means for opposition today is where we'll kind of finish up. First thing you have to know about Russia outside of the Soviet sphere is that the 90s were chaotic. Um, you had two attempted coups, um, one in 91, one in 93, and that led to a creation of a strong presidency. Not going to talk about this here, but just know this is the basis for the idea of a strong presidential system in Russia. And that's going to come back uh, when we talk about the democratic procedural element of this later on in the lecture. You had two long drawn out economic crises. Um, to some Russians, the entirety of the 1990s was a long drawn out 10 year economic crisis. Um, specifically though, we can look at the era of 90 to 1990 to 1995. Um, GDP, um, overall GDP, gross domestic product in Russia fell by about 50% there. Um, 97 to 1999 um, was less about GDP um, uh, or the lack of GDP growth or a continued GDP falling, um, and more about inflation. Really what we saw there, um, in 1998, uh, inflation rose in Russia at 85% that year alone in that three-year period. Um, 1997, it was about 11%, 85% up in, in 1998. And then finally, in 1999, you had a more manageable 36% rise in inflation. Um, so as you can tell, you know, that's a three-year period where you have a gigantic raise in inflation. Um, wages were down over that three-year period for Russian workers by about 30%. Um, pensions were down by about 45%. So you had the ruble. It, it was worth less and less each of those three years. And this is kind of the crisis we saw around the, the Yeltsin presidency. Um, under Boris Yeltsin, we saw, you know, this quick privatization Obviously, there was a large amount of corruption um, around this. Um, there are stories of uh, people selling off, um, you know, during you know the late stages of the Soviet Union, early parts of the Russian um, Federation. You have stories of people selling off oil, um, foodstuffs, and things that they'd basically gotten from the state for free, and kind of siphoning off that to Eastern Europe and even sometimes Western Europe at below market prices to make themselves wealthy um, at the expense of their uh, population. And so this led to this, along with the economic crises, uh, kind of led to um, the idea that democracy um, kind of gets equated with corruption. It gets equated with um, people who would abuse the system for their own gain. Um, and you can see why the common Russian would do that. You have, you know, stories of and, and you know, factually leaders selling off these goods, um, outsourcing them to the West where, you know, there are plenty of foodstuffs, but they come in, um, you know, below market value in the West because they're given to these cities, these mayors, regional governors for free. So the privatization, um, it created new elites. Um, corruption was part of this. It created new wealthy members of society at the expense of the mass public. Life expectancy fell during that 10-year period. Um, crime, human trafficking, drug trafficking also rose. Um, and within all of this, this leads to a direct dissatisfaction with um, democracy. Um, there was a uh, group of researchers who, uh, uh, Mich uh, William Mishler and Richard Rose, um, who undertook a large amount of surveys in Eastern Europe and post-communist countries starting in 1990 um, with the New Europe and New Russia barometers. Um, and you can tell um, by 1992, they had this 10-point scale where they would um, have people in Russia rate their, um, their confidence in Boris Yeltsin. Um, and in 1992, the average of the Russian you know, survey um, was 4.5. So they had a 4.5 out of 10 confidence in Boris Yeltsin. Um, by the end of it in 1999, 
um, he was down to about 1.8. Um, so the, the, you know, that was the mean. Most Russians felt very, um, you know, not confident in his leadership. Um, and he was directly associated with the idea of democracy in Russia. Um, that regime, that, um, that administration, um, that's something we see in new democracies that, um, that effective leadership gets kind of mixed in with citizen feelings of democracy writ large, as well as the democratic actors themselves. So um, the idea of Boris Yeltsin and democracy um, for ordinary Russians were one and the same. Um, and that creates kind of the backdrop here for Vladimir Putin's rule, um, because you have this chaos, you have these coup attempts, you have these, especially the economic crisis and destitution of the Russian people under democracy, that leads a lot of Russians not only to be dissatisfied with democracy, but for them to characterize it as chaotic, as indecisive, as you know, economically you know, incompatible with um, the Russian state. And so when we move over to Vladimir Putin's rule in the 2000s, we start to see his idea was to provide order and stability. And the big thing here to provide order and stability was to grow the economy. And he undertook an idea of technocratic leadership of the state. And what we mean by that is trying to use expertise, trying to use experts to basically put them in places within the bureaucracy to grow the state, strengthening the state. And, and in a way, Vladimir Putin was the opposite of Boris Yeltsin. Both cut their chops in the late stages of the Soviet system. And so um, we saw them both kind of cut their chops, become um, politicians, become influential within the state, the, the Soviet system itself, uh, Vladimir Putin in the KGB, um, and then later on in law school at Leningrad State. Um, Boris Yeltsin, though, was an anti-state politician. And so what he thought that, you know, basically for him, the state got in his way. And what I mean by the state, I mean the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy got in his way of doing things in the late Soviet system. So in the 1990s, he didn't put a lot of emphasis into state building. And, and that was a giant mistake, because if you're going to organize a state, you need a bureaucracy. And he didn't put a giant amount of time into that. Um, Vladimir Putin did in the 2000s. Um, but with that state building, basically came the idea of not building the state to become a democratic state, but also building the state to be part of the administrative regime, right? It was not only strengthening the state, it was strengthening his power within the state itself to essentially play kingmaker um, within the, the state, within the bureaucracy, to be able to hand out influential um, jobs, influential posts, sanction influential economic activities. So who gets these um, deals for um, natural gas lines and, and these oil pipelines? Who gets um, these permits for well digging, for, you know, oil digging and all of these other things. So within his technocratic leadership, there's also a corruption there um, that underlies this. But early on, his idea was technocratic leadership and isolate extreme politicians and ideas. Um, right before he took power, um, or I guess right after he took power, um, there was the apartment bombing by, you know, supposed Chechen terrorists. And so the idea was you can isolate, you know, starting with Islam, Islamist extremism, but then getting caught up within that would be isolating communist extremism, right? The previous left, isolating nationalist extremism that would challenge his, you know, rules. So at, at the beginning of that, if isolating extreme politicians and ideas, that was well supported by, Matt, by the Russian populace. Um, for the most part, the average Russian wanted to see growth, wanted to see stability. They wanted to see an end to um, crime and trafficking. They wanted to see um, stabilization within the economy, the, the end to rising inflation. And his ability to do that and raise economic growth and reduce poverty basically allowed him some leeway to essentially expand his um, his uh, his ability to control the regime. And more of that comes in later, as we'll talk about um, within his democratic procedural rights of, um, you know, how he handled the Belson School massacre. Um, and, and that also plays a role into how we see the expansion of, of his power in Russia kind of almost legally, but 
still extra legally. Um, and so that allowed him to do that. And then the other thing you see, socialization in context matters when we talk about his popularity in Russia versus how the West sees um, Vladimir Putin's rule. For most Westerners, so um, you know, Germany, the United Kingdom, the United States, we see it as autocratic rule. There's elections. Um, they're not free and fair. Um, it's definitely an autocracy. Um, you lack political freedom. I, I mean, the things that we talk about with the poisoning, um, the extra, uh, 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 Navani, um, extrajudicial killings of, uh, of others, um, the incursions into Crimea um, and Georgia in 2008, um, we see that as autocracy, an autocracy that is um, kind of expansional autocracy, right? But for most Russians, uh, they see that system, you have to think about, a lot of these people were socialized under um, a Soviet system, and some of them even under hardline Soviet systems, such as um, under the rule of, of Brezhnev. And so um, when you compare, say, Brezhnev, and even the late stage Soviet system before Perestroika, before Glasnost, um, you see that um, to these people, that, there's more freedom there. Um, and then you have to take into account the idea of freedom as freedom from fear of crime, fear of, of uh, you know, being a victim of crime or um, economic destitution. And with those things, that buys him a little leeway with the Russian people that, hey, we know this regime's corrupt. We know this regime's undemocratic. A, is there another legitimate option out there? And B, it's still better than the alternative we saw before, right? Because you see a lot of Russians remember democracy as chaotic. They remember democracy as indecisive. They remember it as being impoverished. And I'll have a couple of, of graphs here in a second that kind of show this, um, the economic trajectory and, and how different that looks. But you have that, and then you couple it with more, more uh, political freedom, right? It's not political freedom as Americans would view it or um, people who are socialized and grow up in Western democracies would see it or uh, anybody who conceptualizes liberal democracy would see this as, as a completely pretty much closed autocracy. Um, still, for most Russians, it's more political freedom than they're used to, right? For a large chunk of society. And so you add that, in with economic growth and poverty that democracy didn't give you, that creates a strong base of support. And we'll, we'll check that out a little bit with um, his approval rating over time. But you can see here in these next two graphs how Vladimir Putin has used um, economic growth to buy him some leeway. And so within the chart, we start at 1990 here. This is GDP per capita. So it's a little different than the GDP note that I gave you earlier. Um, earlier, I was talking about, you know, just GDP generally not per person. So we have GDP per capita here. And you can see from 1990 to 1995, 1996, GDP per capita um, falls from about almost $10,000 per person um, in 1990 to about um, just under $6,000 per person in um, 1995 and continues dipping until 1998, where you start to see a turnaround um, in 1999. And then look at this growth. Um, in some of these early years, Vladimir Putin was getting, and the Russian economy was growing at almost 7 or 8% every year. Um, and so that underlies that massive economic growth, that massive push forward, um, underlies the fact that, you know, you can have some leeway um, because it's that, per that performance element of we tolerate this regime because, um, and we tolerate the lack of democratic fr or freedom that you would see in a democracy because look at this growth. Um, of course, there's the blip in 2009 um, that pretty much everyone in the world had with the recession. Um, but then you see, again, linear growth starts very quickly, 2000, you know, basically in 2010. Then it starts to hit this rough button. And this is where we're starting to talk about the leveling off of the Russian economy, rise in opposition. This is the era we actually see um, a rise in extrajudicial killings. This is where we start to see more of that coercion and surveillance. This is where we start to see more of the direct election rigging and some of these other things and the rising discontent um, as well, that people may not be as, as happy with the regime as they were previously. But the GDP per capita only tells about half the story. 
The other thing that he did that, that happened masterfully early on in the regime, look at this poverty headcount. So this is a percent of the population um, that is uh, surviving on five dollars and five U.S. dollars and fifty cents a day or less. Um, you know, the world, uh, both of these measures come from um, the World Bank, their world development indicators, um, and they have a few measures of that, $1.90, $3.20, um, and those are generally, you know, told of global extreme poverty at, you know, U.S. dollars 190 or $3.20. Um, for 550, we're talking about poverty, right? We're not talking about global extreme poverty, but look at this, and by 2000, just under 45% of the Russian population was living under $5.50 a day. By 2008, that had dropped to under 10% to about 8%. And then, you know, it, con it continues to fall off to its low point in 2014 and 2018, where you're under 5% and a managed under 5% of the population living under, you know, $5.50 a day. Um, so that's a massive increase in poverty. So not only did you see GDP growth, right? So the growth of the economy itself, but you saw that extend to the mass public in poverty reduction. When you're talking about 45% of your population living at, at a poverty, an international poverty threshold, that's a large amount. And to get that under 10% in eight years is, is almost, you know, miraculous, right? And that's, that's an amazing amount of poverty and, and economic growth. So this underlies kind of this um, performance mechanisms of how he was able to create support. The other thing he does and has done pretty well is this democratic procedural. So there are two elements to this. First one is ruling the executive. And the next one in the next slide, we'll talk about elections. Um, so how has he ruled the executive in a democratically procedural way? Well, First off, our old friend comes back of the two coup attempts in the 1990s. As I alluded to earlier, this led to a constitution that favored a strong presidency. Since Boris Yeltsin had to, you know, basically send in tanks to shell the parliament and the legislature, basically what this leads to is this idea that we aren't going to be able to forge a consensus to move forward as a Russian people unless we have a strong presidency who can wield power to basically put aside these differences in the Duma and essentially make sure that we can grow the economy, we can ensure democracy, because essentially the, the parliament is so split, the Duma is so split, that it's not going to allow us to do that. One thing we know in political science and democratization literature is that when you set up a constitution for a strong executive, if you make that executive too strong without the checks from the legislature or, the, or a strong judiciary, you're asking for that constitution to fail. Um, the Russian constitution was made to fail um, simply because it put too much hands, the power in the hands of one person. And really, by the time you get to 1999, there was... It was going to be easy for a man like Vladimir Putin to take power and consolidate that power quickly. He was able to consolidate it because of a couple of things. It, it allows him to wield power early on somewhat in line with the democratic constitution, right? He has these strong powers. He uses them. He uses them to do things that's very popular in Russia, right? Almost this Madisonian curse, right? If we think back to the Federalist Papers, James Madison and the U.S. democratization, Madison talks about factions and, um, and, and or he talks about um, in Federalist 51, where he's talking about um, constraining the executive and, and using, um, creating a system that creates gridlock and not wanting things to change. Um, um, because, and he talks about factions, you know, the majority overrunning the minority and stuff like that. And that's essentially what Vladimir Putin does early on in the, in the Russian regime. He has no checks on his power, essentially. There's some from the Duma, but he's doing things that are widely popular to the Russian people. He's, you know, uh, putting Chechen terrorists in line. He's um, essentially um, clasping down on extremist leaders who are, the, who, you know, whose fault it is that we are poor and destitute now. He's getting rid of corruption while creating his own brand of corruption, getting rid of other leaders who were corrupt in the 90s to create leaders who, you know, were corrupt, but who were in his pocket in the 2000s. 
So he's doing these things that are widely popular and he doesn't have checks and he's doing things that are majority popular. So he's doing things that are sort of in line with the constitution, um, maybe a little bit extra constitutional, but nobody says anything about it because it's popular. And then, so the weak state in the 1990s, as I mentioned earlier, also allowed him to claim a mandate on strengthening the state. Basically, he sells people on this idea that they need more state power to essentially, you know, create a bureaucracy that can create infrastructure. And he's not wrong here. He's actually right on. And the Russian people support him of this. But also, like I said, that means to him not only strengthening the state itself, not only creating infrastructure, it also means strengthening the regime. It also means allowing himself later on to play kingmaker within the formal and informal institutions within the regime, those linkage institutions such as the media and political parties. You know, by 2012, hey, he's the kingmaker. We all knew this. We all knew when Dmitry Medvedev was elected in 2008 that he was just a placeholder for Vladimir Putin. Um, and so all of this starts to allow him to strengthen the administrative regime. And by 2004, he ends his presidency with an 83% approval rating. Um, and we're talking about from the Levada Center, we're talking about actual scientific polling. He was ridiculously popular. Um, then comes the Beslan School Massacre. The Beslan School Massacre basically allows him to seize even more power and add even more reforms within the Constitution without anybody batting an eye. And this is really where we start to see the basis of, you know, his ability to, to you know, th these look like democratic procedures, right? These are things that happen in the West, right? These ideas that, um, yeah, we can get rid of extremism, right? G Germany has laws that allows them to dissolve parties who are, you know, essentially neo-Nazi parties. They dissolve the, um, uh, the NDP based on this in, you know, the early 2020-teens. So the idea that he can combat extremism, you know, the U.S. has the Patriot Act, all of these things fit within the idea that, hey, democracies do this, so, you know, we can't really, and they're popular, so we can't really say anything about it. Um, the Beslan School Massacre, right, this idea in the name of security that we need extra mandates and we need extra laws, it allowed him to directly appoint governors, and this becomes key because later on what happens is when we start seeing these crisis points today or over the past 10 years, you know who takes the fall? The, the chief never takes the fall. It's always somebody underneath them, right? And so, you know, basically um, what happens is, hey, yeah, something went wrong in St. Petersburg. Well, it's the mayor of St. Petersburg's fault or it's the governor's fault who I appointed. So we, you know, send him off to a nice, you know, um, retirement area where he can, you know, be out of sight, out of mind, give him a nice mansion somewhere. I'll appoint a new governor. Right. And then I tell the people that, hey, the problem's fixed. We got rid of the governor that um, that was too inept to create to fix this problem. So the, the problem's fixed. Right. That's kind of the idea of the regime is the regime doesn't take the hits. Lower levels within the regime start to take the hits. That's the point of this. And then, in essence, the Russian Constitution, it didn't have constraints. Um, and he used this slowly to whittle away accountability, consolidate his regime. Question mark's not supposed to be there. That's supposed to be a period. Um, and so basically what we see here is he acts within these democratic procedures because the Russian constitution allowed him too early on. And then because it allowed him too early on, he was able to fix the rules of the, this game, right, um, over time to create the democratic procedures that gave him these what would be extrajudicial powers that we would see even today with the extension of um, the term length of the presidency, and then now going all in on the gambit um, of not allowing, uh, of allowing himself to run as long as he wants to, right? Um, and so that, you know, and, you know, the idea of taking away the two term limit and all of this stuff, which he took a hit, you know, publicly because of, but even then it's so slight. I, I mean, there's uh, about 53% of Russians um, today say that, you know, in a recent survey that, yeah, they're okay with him running again in 2024, right? So you have a majority there, not a stark majority, but a majority, and only about one in four Russians actually worry about a cult of personality around him. Um, so you don't see that, you have a large amount of that passivity element as well. Um, and, and that also comes back here when we talk about um, elections, 
So Russian elections, um, they're not free, they're not fair, they do serve a purpose, right? We talked about it early on in the lecture. Um, some Russians actually view the elections as fair, equate it with democracy, say this is just part of democratic you know, procedures, especially people who support the United Russia Party or Vladimir Putin. The other part of this is it signals state strength to opposition. Um, basically, it signals to opposition partisans that, hey, guess what? We are so strong. We organize who the winner is, right? They have video cameras in about 80% of polling stations, and probably over the last two, um, the recent Duma election last month, as well as the presidential election 2018, you probably saw these videos surface of, you know, I think it's 2018 where, you know, the... Uh, lady looks who's working the polling place looks around nobody's watching she just stuffs ballots in the ballot box um then we see there was a, a video with the recent duma election where a guy comes out of a bowling voting booth and they have their large clear rectangle you know rectangles almost looks like a, a paper shredder um and uh and what they do is they put their ballots in those large rectangular holders and the, the man puts you know just a handful of ballots in there um, so we know these elections are rigged. The opposition knows the election is rigged. So it signals at some point we organize the winner. Even uh, one of the Russian um, uh, opposition partisans, uh, presidential candidates in 2018, noted it wasn't Novani, it was um, uh, Sobchak's uh, daughter, I believe. Uh, anyway, um, that you know Vladimir Putin, you know, in a system created by Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin wins the election. Um, there is this resignation, even within people running against him, that he's going to win. Now, rigging the election does have its costs. Um, people who see the election unfair are less likely to support the regime. However, one, these people are, tend to become de demobilized, as I've kind of alluded to throughout this. They become demobilized. Um, they say there's the average of uh, idea that hey, they would win no matter what. There's a 2012 study um, that basically asks Russians, okay, who do you think you know, would win if, if the elections weren't rigged? And, and they all still think Vladimir Putin. Um, they still think the United Russia Party. So um, they become demobilized. It's part of this passivity mechanism that, yeah, the state is signaling strength that, hey, the opposition is powerless to do anything about this. And also the economy outweighs this concern for a lot of Russians. People who see the economy as good, even if they do see the elections as unfair, tend to often support the regime. So that, um, especially amongst older cohorts, so that idea that I showed you on that first on that first slide about Russia, about the, the um, performance element, still matters a lot. And then you have several opposition parties that are pro-regime opposition, um, such as the Communist Party, that they're in it to get a piece of the pie but they're not going to bring up an ideology that's pro-democratic or anti-regime against Vladimir Putin. They're there to get a piece of the pie for them and their supporters, and that's it. At the end of the day, if they get some of the benefits uh, of the state, whether that be infrastructure, whether that be kickbacks or, or you know, clientelism sort of things, whatever it may be, that's what they're you know interested in. So Let's sum it up. We've got a few uh, slides here to kind of sum everything up. First of all, let's talk about is democracy a viable option in Russia? And I'm not going to bury the lead with this one. Probably not. Um, not in um, the current situation. First of all, Putin's regime is really strong, not only when it comes to those co coercion and surveillance elements that make it strong, that make the state strong, that allow it them to kind of surveil the populace and keep would-be opposition leaders under his thumb, right? We see the um, poisoning of Navani, uh, uh, um, as we just talked about um, in, in recent events. Basically, with that, it helps to keep strong opposition leaders out of power, out of the public eye, um, and away from um, these sort of, uh, from the ability to um, actually rise and challenge the regime. Um, and when we talk about, um, and so Putin's regime, uh, it's strong and enjoys a decent amount of public support. You see kind of the high watermark here um, in 2014 through about 2018. Um, since then we've seen, and, and that was during an economic crisis starting in 2014 as well. Um, 
we've seen that drop somewhat, but even as of, as of uh, August 2021, um, this, this data comes from the Lavada Center, um, a public uh, policy polling institute in Russia and Moscow. And what we see here, um, even with this drop, as of August 2021, his approval rating is still somewhere around 63%. Um, so that's still um, something there. And then remember, it's not just about approval or disapproval. It's also about who participates, right? And so if you have an approval rating of about 63% and you have a decent amount of the population who's not willing to participate in politics because of that passivity sort of mechanism of legitimation, that takes away some of the actual pressure on the regime, right? Because all of this comes down to the a collective, uh, a collective action problem, right? Are you willing to potentially get jailed, get killed to challenge his regime. And a lot of people are. And then you add in that it's still popular. That, that takes a lot of it. There. Um, the Russians want change. I got a couple really quick here. Vast majority want change. 83% in August 2017 survey said they want at least get gradual change. However, what that means is less clear. A lot of Russians don't have concrete examples. And even if they do, it's stuff like infrastructure, the economy to grow again inflation reduction. It's things that, you know, are, are tacitly tied that the administration could do and the regime could do. And for a lot of Russians, that's what they see. They see Vladimir Putin as the main chance for reform. Um, there's a quote from Kolesnikov and Volkov 2018. This is the long-standing model. Putin embodies the hope of each disparate societal group. He is the main liberal, the main nationalist, imperialist, and socialist. Thus, view, many view him as the main reformer, too. Um, he's, he's been able to dynamically lead the Russian people out of that economic rut of the 1990s. And because of that, he enjoys a lot of what we would call kind of diffuse support that, hey, we don't like the way things are going right now, but you have kind of this underlying support that we believe this regime is better than alternatives. Um, and so that's kind of where we end here. Um, is democracy a viable option? Um, Opposition tends to be fractured. Um, I, I know we want to talk a lot about the opposition movements. Uh, Navani uh, uh, sees uh, uh, a lot of support. Um, but state media, um, he's got strong opposition leaders. Still, even at his top rated um, level of media interaction, he's seeing about 13% of the population, mostly in Moscow, mostly in St. Petersburg, other um, cities where you see young, urban, um, populations who might support democracy, um, and state of media essentially sidelines him and his anti-corruption message. Um, you're not going to see him on um, state media, which is really strong. Um, like I said, I, I, I'm not going to go too far into this, but I, I'm happy to take questions on it. Um, like I mentioned before, in increased state strength and control leads to extra state surveillance, extra judicial arrests and killings. And finally, Democracy in the public sphere um, often seen as chaotic and indecisive because of the 1990s. And media coverage in Russia tends to um, reinforce this, both in traditional mediums, such as TV and newspapers, but also online. Um, misinfo campaigns and troll farms. This started in 2012-2013. That's where Vladimir Putin really cut his teeth in the misinformation campaign online. Um, because of the protests against the Duma election in late 2011 and the presidential election in March 2012, that's where he cut his teeth in this idea of how do we dissuade people from protesting um, and organizing online? Because in that winter of discontent, he almost saw his version of the Arab uprisings. Um, he got probably the closest he's ever been to seeing um, his regime being actually challenged in, in that era. Um, and so this misinfo campaigns and this media coverage, it reinforces this idea as democracy is chaotic and indecisive. So a lot of these things that he and these troll farms, these bots tend to push, and then traditional media, if you go to rt.com, the um, arm of Russian today, the online arm of that, you can see how they frame democracy as chaotic, democracy is indecisive. And so it gives that hollow example of 
I have um, some questions in the chat. I'm gonna kind of take them thematically as opposed to um, in temporal order. Um, thematically, I mean by how they relate back to some of the main themes in your presentation. So I have a Rob and a Robbie in here. So if I confuse the two, I apologize in advance. But one question from Robbie that kind of strikes at what you were talking about with uh, kind of that comparison-based legitimacy and economic growth says, how um, does, or how do the youth in Russia play into this? Many Russians only know the Putin regime, but don't remember the chaotic 1990s or the Soviet Union. So does that have an impact on Putin's potential legitimacy? Yeah. I in a way, I think so. Um, a, because as you pointed out, younger Russians, um, you're starting to see, yeah, I guess, you know, 21 year olds and under only know the, the Putin regime. Um, so for them, and even for, you know, people who are, you know, a little bit older than that, they, they probably don't remember those young years under the Yeltsin regime, although they may hear stories about it. Um, so yeah, in, in a way, I do think this impacts his legitimacy. It, he doesn't have maybe that diffuse support as I talked about. So in political science, we talk about specific support, which is where you support the actions of government. And over time, basically that builds diffuse support, this idea that we might not like things that are going on right now, but we, you've built up some level of clout that we will give you essentially a little bit of leeway to lead us out of this crisis, to lead us out of this. And I think for a lot of older Russians, Vladimir Putin definitely has that diffuse support. He has that idea of, okay, we don't like the economy now, but you know, it, it's still better than the 90s, or it's better than um, communism. And so with younger Russians, they do tend to be less satisfied with the regime. Um, they do tend to be more critical. They also tend to be more urban, um, more online. Um, and the bigger issue with this, though, is has, you know, it might hurt his legitimacy, but as he's consolidated the regime and state strength, can he find pathways to bring them into the regime? And sometimes he has, right? That's what the internet is meant to do. He had completely controlled the media kind of aspect of this with the traditional media, the um, newspapers, the radio, the, uh, the television especially. And then 2011, 2012 kind of blindsided him because it was, he didn't, almost didn't think of the chaos from the, the internet, right? And so since then, he's, he sought to create more overt control over the internet, um, one through misinformation, but also through ownership right? Um, he now appoints people who, you know, or doesn't appoint, but basically in, you know, practice, but, you know, kind of appoints or, um, or has a large say in people who run Odno Klesniki, um, which is classmates in Russian, or Vikontakte, which is Russian Facebook, literally go look at Vikontakte, it looks exactly like Facebook. Um, and, and so he's trying to bring the younger generation in. I don't know off the top of my head, how well it's working. Um, sometimes it takes, you know, a, a little bit of time to see how these new generations decide they want to sort of, uh, you know, politically participate. Are they apathetic? Are they participatory? And so sometimes it takes a little bit of time to recognize that. And I think in the next five years, though, we can probably start making some, you know, generalizations on Russian youth and how they um, see the regime, how they see Vladimir Putin and that sort of thing. Of course, by five or six more years, he's got another term and, and closing in on, you know, halfway through it. So um, hopefully that answers that. Okay, so related to that then, um, Putin seems to be a relatively healthy guy. He's not necessarily getting any younger though. Um, he's a bit of a kleptocrat, so he's accumulated quite a bit of money for himself. Do you see any sort of coordinated leadership transition at any point in the near to medium term where Putin gets to change his own uh, or gets to choose his own successor? Again, that's a question from Robbie. Thank you, Robbie. Yes, and thank you for the questions. Um, 
yes, I, I think he wants to do that eventually. Um, a, I think he likes being in power. Um, people who are autocrats don't like giving up power. Um, they, they are power hungry for a reason, right? There's a reason autocrats become autocrats. In a way, I almost think 2008 was a test run. One, because I don't know if he had the political clout to basically change that election and the constitutional dynamic there. Um, but I almost think it was a test run of, let's see how Medvedev runs this. And then maybe in a couple of terms, I, you know, I can entrust him to this. Because as you mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Revenzer, uh, the, 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 uh, the kleptocratic nature of this makes it where you want a fixer. And historically, Vladimir Putin has been a fixer. That's why he got promoted to prime minister and, and elected president. That's why, you know, Boris Yeltsin had the same problems of kleptocracy. And in a state where he could lose the next election, and thus, you know, somebody else, somebody who um, was his political opposition could, you know, basically have them look into Boris Yeltsin's dealings and corruption. He wanted somebody who was a fixer, who could fix those problems and make those problems go away for him. And Vladimir Putin was that man. And so um, I, I think that's the idea um, within that. And, uh, and, and that kind of, I guess, goes a little bit um, uh, to Rob's earlier question about, you know, the money laundering, the Pandora Papers, the Panama Papers, and some of this stuff that, you know, the, the money laundering happens to try and create safe havens in case something goes wrong. Um, but also, if he can rule stably for the next six to, you know, it, it's 2021, he's got another term, so it's another nine years. He's almost 72. He, that put him about 80, 81. I think he would like to have somebody there, and I think it's Dmitry Medvedev. Um, I just think that Dmit the early, he might have wanted to retire a little bit earlier, but I think the, the change from Medvedev back to Putin in 2012 went so poorly and was so poorly received um, because Dmitry Medvedev was really popular, especially with young Russians, kind of going back to your earlier question, um, and they felt betrayed by that. Um, that, you know, Putin just got to play kingmaker. They wanted another four years of, of Dmitry Medvedev. And so I think the reason that played poorly is the reason, obviously, you see the six-year, the increased presidential term um, to give him that until maybe about 80. And then you can have somebody like Dmitry Medvedev who can take over and hopefully be, or Vladimir Putin at least, hopefully be his um, fixer and make those problems of kleptocracy go away and he can kind of retire. I think they're is that element there? But when it happens, I don't know. That, that's the big question because it is, you know, you mentioned relatively healthy, although getting older. But I think he wants to have that back, that, um, uh, that, that in, uh, on the back burner. So when it does happen, he is prepared because um, Vladimir Putin is nothing if not very meticulous about these, these decisions um, when it comes to legitimacy. That's kind of his overall thing and something we kind of misunderstand in the West. Um, we often ask, what are his motives? What are his motives? He's very transactional, and he's very focused on legitimacy at home and retaining power at home, and, and that's a big thing. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, so we have another question um, from Bob Fannin about the impact of sanctions against Russia Russia is often subject to sanctions for its actions in Crimea and um, targeted assassinations. And so um, has that had any kind of an impact on the Russian economy or on Putin or and or on Putin's reputation in Russia? Well, it's, it's affected the economy. Um, but sort of in fits and starts, because as we know, the sanctions, some of them got lifted um, in uh, 2017, I believe. So some of them got lifted. That allowed some liability, you know, uh, wiggle room, um, reimposed in 2020. Um, the bigger thing is the pandemic, uh, which has crushed everybody. So I don't know if how much Russians blame him for this. It, it has obviously hurt the economy. Um, there's recent reports out that um, Russia is having an inflationary crisis. I know this shocks pretty much probably no one here at this uh, at, at this uh, meeting that lots of the world is having an inflationary crisis due to um, global bottlenecks, due to COVID and, and uh, 
COVID uh, restrictions and all this other stuff and, uh, <clears throat> and supply bottlenecks due to that. And so Russians, Russia's no um, stranger to that, just like we are here in the U.S. right now. Um, as far as sanctions go, they're hurting Russia, but they're very targeted sanctions right now. Um, early on, that first uh, kind of uh, round of sanctions in 2014 with Crimea um, really, really did a number on the Russian economy, but only for a short period of time. And he's been able to offset the losses with economic performance with what a lot of Russians see as foreign policy wins. They honestly see Crimea as a foreign policy win. They see Syria as a foreign policy win. And so he's been able to offset some of the problems at home with wins abroad, right? So um, this is kind of a, a you know, two-faceted thing where his performance, most of what I talked about was the economic performance, domestic performance. But a lot of Russians do enjoy that idea of being a prominent player in world affairs, much as they were during the Soviet era. And so I think he's been able to offset some of that reputational damage. Um, but amongst what groups, kind of back to Robbie's question, amongst what groups, how, um, that kind of remains to be seen because of a lot of our surveys, and I don't want to get too into the nitty gritty, but you know, a lot of our surveys are 1,600 people, 2,000 people at a time. And so it's really hard to analyze subgroups within those surveys um, because of the way not to get too into it, um, the way math works um, and the way statistical significant works. Once you start analyzing those subgroups, um, you might not find as much significance there because you have fewer people within those subgroups. Um, so yeah, so it might have taken, you know, a fall in reputation here and there, but where remains to be seen and overall still pretty healthily. You can see in the, in the graph though, um, in his, uh, approval ratings that I got from the Levada Center. Um, they do fall about 2018, 2019. So there is some pushback on this. How much and where though that, that remains to be seen. And will that lead to meaningful change? Probably not in the short term, uh, I would say. Thank you for that. Um, speaking of foreign policy wins, um, Rob Rowan has asked a number of questions related to um, the relationship between Russia and the United States, especially during um, the previous administration. So to kind of wrap all that up into a single thing, does Russia view its relationship, or does, do, do you get the sense that Putin views the Russia-US relationship under President Trump as one of those foreign policy wins or is this something we overplay in the United States as a result of the fact that we're in the United States? Or um, does the public view that as something where Russia has established some prestige or gained some prestige at the, the expense of the United States? In a way, some of it's overplay. Um, just because we, we're in America and we like um, all of our news stories a lot of times to be about us. Um, for instance, you had the 2017 election uh, in the Czech Republic with Andrei Andre, uh, Babish, and he was labeled the Czech Trump. Um, the, really, the only thing that connected them is they were both very wealthy um, and, and running for office in their own, con in their own country. So um, we do like that, and we do overplay it a little bit. Um, I think for Vladimir Putin, he is a, a, a international policy realist, and, and in that, that power dynamics matter, and that's all that matters. Um, you know, you can tell this when discussing things with Angela Merkel when he invaded Crimea. Angela Merkel called him, and, and she had a press conference later, and she said, it's like he's, from, you know, speaking something from another planet. He's from another planet, and Angela Merkel is somewhat right because she sees the world as kind of a you know, international liberal, meaning that, you know, you have these multi mutual beneficial ties, such as the economy, such as um, peace and stability. Why would you want to blow them up? For Vladimir Putin, it's all about power dynamics. So he is speaking a different language than I think we noticed with this. And one of those po power dynamics for him is keeping control, keeping the legitimacy of his regime. And so I think in that sense, um, in that sense, he 
he did gain something under you know, the Trump administration because the Trump administration was a little more isolationist than we've seen previous administrations, especially um, since the end of the Cold War, right? Um, we'd seen a lot of you know, internationalism, whether that be you know, promoting free trade um, and structural adjustment in the 1990s, whether that be um, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, whether that be um, name any number of things, right? We, we saw more U.S. interventionalism, U.S. Um, support for democracy, human rights, and all of these different things. And I think you got to win there because the more the U.S. focuses in on herself, and that's the kind of what I go back to where we're collateral damage with the misinformation campaigns and some of this other stuff. He essentially wants us to be divided. That, that's the big thing here is the more we hit the West and the United States and our stronger uh, allies in NATO have to focus on ourselves or the EU or something like this, the more he can focus on consolidating power at home and consolidating power in the near abroad, right? And his, his issue with the near abroad, so Belarus, Ukraine, um, even Mo Moldova and Georgia, isn't so much that he has to have a friendly dictator like he has in Kazakhstan um, or he has in some of these other CIS states in, in Central Asia, um, but he at least needs them not to be friendly to the West. He needs them at least chaotic enough where NATO's not on his doorstep because he's a realist. And he, he believes even, you know, despite the 1997 um, non-aggression pact between NATO and Russia, you know, that basically stated, yeah, Russia's not a threat to NATO anymore and NATO's not a threat to Russia anymore. He still saw NATO and, you know, um, NATO and EU uh, alignments in Eastern Europe as a direct threat to Russia and a direct threat to his rule, especially the joining of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania with NATO and, and the EU, but more importantly, NATO. Um, and so with that, I, I think he gained something in the West becomes disorganized, the West becomes chaotic, but it's not just the US. We saw this with you know, Germany and, and Germany, how much do they want to pay forward within NATO? How much do they want to format their foreign policy um, towards Russia? Um, it, it's a bigger question for the West in general. And I think that's the biggest thing he gained there is um, the unwillingness to combat the idea that he could incur or do things in Syria, whatever he wanted, right? And get this. But in essence, Syria may have been lost at you know, the beginning of that just because um, Russia, you know, and, and Iran, that's, you, you know this, you're a foreign policy expert. They're, uh, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're main, Syria is a main area of concern for Russia and Iran. For us, it's kind of tertiary at best, right? And so, um, you know, a lot of times when, when people, when something matters to people, um, it, it's a lot, you know, more serious for them and they tend to hold on long. See this sort of with Afghanistan a little bit as well. All right, so I have one more question as we kind of wind toward the end here. We just recently had elections in the Russian Duma. So can we glean anything from that in terms of overall trends and the popularity of United Russia? I mean, it looks like they did almost as good as last time, but not quite as good as last time. Um, is there anything we can discern from that in terms of Putin's popularity and his ability to build an institutional party that's going to outlast him? Uh, yes and no. Um, in a way, it coordinates the idea of, of the strength of the party, right? Um, the ability to uh, essentially you know, make the results you want to make. Um, one of the, the great examples of this um, was in actually outside of the Duma elections, but in the St. Petersburg mayoral race, um, there was a strong opposition candidate named Boris Vizhnevsky. So what happened, and you can, if you Google this uh, after the, the uh, presentation, you can find this, but so what happened is he's a strong opposition candidate. The mayor of St. Petersburg is um, a friend of Vladimir Putin's. And so what happened is um, two more opposition candidates, also named Boris Vishnevsky, so two people changed their name to Boris Vishnevsky and decided to run for mayor of St. Petersburg. What's more, um, the original Boris Vishnevsky had a beard, so two guys who sort of look like him decide to grow beards, change their name to Boris Vishnevsky, and run for office in St. Petersburg. Effectively confusing and, you know, 
anybody who would you know vote for him, um, confusing him. And, and so again, it's a really good example of we create the outcomes we want to create. Um, so I think in that way, yeah, it's something to glean. As far as their popularity, you have to pay attention to extra systemic things, not necessarily elections, but protests. Um, and again, we saw some slight protests. The interesting one to me was the Communist Party protesting. Um, it was a small protest. It was, um, I believe, mainly in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, but that was interesting to me because they have historically been one of those kind of pro-regime parties that they're kind of in bed with the United Russia Party of like, hey, we'll take some kickbacks. We'll take some, you know, preference as long as we get some people in there. So them protesting was a little interesting here. Um, maybe not getting the amount of seats they wanted um, within this system. But um, that's the biggest thing, two takeaways I think I would learn from that. All right. Thank you, Dr. Plasek. Well, this concludes um, our presentation. I don't know if we could all give a virtual round of applause to Dr. Plasek for his wonderful presentation today. I certainly learned a lot, and this is something that I consider myself fairly well read on. I want to remind all of you to join us for the next Beyond the Headlines session. That's going to happen on November 16th. And the title is Africa and China Symbiotic Relationship or Neocolonial Relationship. It'll be led by me. And um, we'll talk about Chinese investment on the African continent. And attendees will learn about the Africa-China relationship and what this relationship means for economic development in Africa. So keep an eye out for the registration link um, and um, you should see that soon. Tracy, is there anything you wanted to do to wrap this up? Or Rob? Yep, we're good to go, and we look forward to seeing everyone at November's event with you, Trevor. Yes, I hope to see you live and in person. Take care, everyone.